Hey there, preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. I wanted to share my gratitude for each and every one of you who've given so generously to our spring fundraising campaign so far. Thank you. I feel blessed to be a part of this working preacher community with you, and I can't wait to see the impact you'll have coming together as a community of preachers to help inspire and nurture fellow preachers. We need to raise $75,000 during the spring campaign in order to keep Working Preacher working for you. Gifts of any size will make a tremendous difference. Did you know that you can make monthly gifts to Working Preacher? Monthly gifts are a great budget-friendly option to fit any needs. If you haven't had a chance to make a gift yet, don't worry, you still have time. Head over to workingpreacher.org to make your gift online before May 31st. And we'll send you the ebook Sustaining the Preaching Life, available only to donors of the spring campaign. Thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for Holy Trinity Sunday, which falls on May 26, 2024. And our readings are are from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Our psalm is number 29. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. And our gospel, equally familiar, is John 3 verses 1 through 17. I've heard these verses, I think, before. <laughs> <laughs> I think recently, but... Maybe. <laughs> that's right. Do we want to talk about why they're here? I mean, the lectionary seems to go out of its way to find places where God, Son, and Spirit are all mentioned together. Yes. Well, that's true for all these the passages, right? Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's, of course, the first observation and then homiletically, then the preacher has to, we we talk about this, I, I'm sure every year, but for sure, every festival Sunday is, do you, you know, do you, do you choose one text as a way to imagine or to metaphorize or give a, give a sense of, of what, you know, what the Holy, what, what difference does the Holy Trinity mean or make? Uh, and so how each of the texts might speak a, a specific word into, into that imagination of what, of what the Holy Trinity is and why, why it's important and what difference does it make. Although I'm not sure that I want to hear a sermon about that, honestly. <laughs> You know, I don't think I want to hear a sermon on the apo- uh, uh, an apology for the for tri- for the Trinity. So this is you know this is where I I my default is always the text to say mm-hmm. you know to say is there something in this text that that offers an expression of the Godhead that rather than solves it or explains it kind of makes it even more complicated <laughs> um, because that's really what the Trinity is. I mean, I think the Trinity is an attempt. Uh, don't tell our systematic colleague, systematic theologian colleagues about this, but it's an attempt um, as all of our attempts are to, to uh, capture in some way the, the the massiveness of God, <laughs> and no, none of our attempts is adequate, and so uh, so maybe that's a one way to approach it is to say we can't we can't but is there's just one thing about this text that says yeah here's an element of God and God chooses to express God's self in in these three particular ways but at the same time that's not even sufficient right to to give imagination for what who God is and what God is about so maybe I and I, I didn't I, answer the question but that's I, know, going, right? I, I appreciate that in the sense that maybe in the imagination of preachers as they're preparing this rather than trying to explain it 
to have uh, in there um, y- y- just sort of this sense of how do I convey this awesomeness? And and the whole idea is to put it out there uh, almost in the way that Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus isn't getting it. You know, Mm-mm. clearly Jesus has a point to what he's saying, but this teacher is missing it, which means there's a whole lot of humor in this text. There's a whole lot said in this text. And yes, we can get nerdy and systematic and try to pull it all together. But what if we simply homiletically decided what we want to do is to stir up the imagination so that our listeners will leave like Nicodemus going, there was a reason I came to see you. And I don't, I can't, haven't wrapped my gray matter around it yet, but I'm still intrigued. Yeah, I think um, I think it's okay to say that uh, we would all be confused too if we were Nicodemus' shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But there's something <laughs> about Jesus is saying that seems deliberately um, obscure, and that's fine. And so the text means more when John's being written, and there's a community of people who, in the shadow of the resurrection, believe things about Jesus. And the and the and the text means more now, post. Chalcedon, Nicaea, you know, all the councils. So, and just to be honest about that, that all of our theological readings of scripture are looking back saying, all right, based on the source material, based Mm -hmm. on the experiences, the traditions, but also based on what's happened, what we've experienced, what we think we know, what do we think about this? And that that's, of course, that's going to mean that we see more connections or uh, maybe we're less confused, maybe in some cases more confused by it. And to say that's that's what theology is all about, folks. Like if you came, <laughs> uh, we've got some really good answers about a lot of things, but they're all proposals, hypotheses. Um, and even the Trinity too, I would say, if you wanted to veer into some of that, uh, the question of like the origins of Trinitarian theology to say the Trinity is not a doctrine that's meant to say, ta-da, we've answered the question. The Trinity, I think Trinitarian doctrine is meant to say, try reading scripture through this lens and see what Mm -hmm. happens, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It should drive you back to the text. It should Mm -hmm. drive you back to those original witnesses and say, okay, if Jesus is God, if Jesus is the spirit, if indeed they are all the Trinitarian theology says that they are, what, now what comes out of the text? How does it sit with you? Does that ring true to your life, to your experience, to our tradition? And to kind of I'm not creative enough to think about how I would do this, but how do you kind of map that? Or how do you take people through that in the course of a sermon to discover things and to say, yeah. 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 No, I think that, that, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And maybe, and that makes me think that if we do take this text seriously, when it comes to Trinity Sunday, that we do then take, Nicodemus's question seriously to Jesus, which is, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And so isn't that what Trinity, the, the Holy Trinity is? It's like the presence of God and and the way in which God expresses God's self. And in this case, it's the unfathomable, unfathomable, I can't say that word today. Uh, better you than me. <laughs> reality of, of God in the flesh. And yet, and, and the utter uh, impossibility of that, but, but also then connecting it to the spirit. And you get that play on words in verse eight, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes or from where it goes. So it's, it's, it's I think that's kind of a, a, a commentary, if you will, on this is God we're talking about. God can pretty much show up in, in whatever form and whatever place and God wish God wishes. And, uh, and so there's, I think there's a, almost a confessional claim about that, that absolute, um, autonomy, but also unpredictable, unpredictability of God that, uh, that, that maybe sets, sets in motion that what also what the Trinity invites is, um, is in a way that unexpectedness of God's presence. Um, 
and mm-hmm. where and where and even I'm even connecting Anothen here, unless you are born from above anew again, uh, just it also complexifies this this the reality of of God's being, and um, yeah. So maybe maybe the, maybe the Trinity is like a like you said, it's a hermeneutic for scripture, but it's also a hermeneutic for our, how we do theology. Um, and imagine God and what, how we imagine God showing up. Playing, playing with that Greek idea um, and, and the echoes that um, uh, Matt was mentioning in terms of we're reading this with all of these other experiences, uh, all of these other teachings on us. And taking Nicodemus's conversation with Jesus specifically in this text directly, um, that that translation, which you just sort of went back and forth with, Caroline, is it from above or is it from uh, below? Um, I just learned this story from um, uh, from ancient times of of where the um, the language of uh, being born uh, again. Is is used in uh, um, I guess uh, the the uh, Greek language uh, where uh, it's a story of when a shark when a baby shark is born and um, it comes out of its mother and it sees danger um, that it would uh, actually go back into the mother's womb and then be born. Uh, uh, again, <laughs> and 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 so there's there's this ancient story that the early readers of this text would be familiar with that actually makes sense with this question that Nicodemus is is could be asking. It's like, okay, I know I've heard about baby sharks doing this, but my mama's not going to be around like a shark. Um, and and I say that because I just learned that, but also it's playing on the humor that is in this text throughout it, let's not wrap our gray matter around the God who will be what God wishes to be. Let's allow God the majesty and the mystery and the awe that showing up as Father, Son, and Spirit should actually evoke from us in our imaginations. And I hope that you were impressed with my little Greek uh, knowledge back <laughs> That would make the whole baby shark song a lot weirder in my mind. Uh, yes, the baby. <laughs> I, think I know. I was thinking that too, <laughs> and I was also real. I'm also makes me uh, a little bit relieved that my children are not watching that <laughs> show those shows anymore. <laughs> I was okay, fine. Now that everybody, color. we're not going to sing it, but it, it doesn't matter. Everybody has that earworm in their ear. Their that tune is. Yeah, really I, I'm glad I had the Teletubbies and Arthur. I'm good with yeah. that. <laughs> if the song is stuck in your head, send your emails to Joy to complain. Yes. Not to me. I didn't sing it. I am refraining. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my head. I want to share. <laughs> Isaiah? This is this is my call text. And so it it it's it's so often a call text for so many others. Uh, and and so we hear it uh, over and over again. Um, how do we uh, get away from it simply being a testimony about me hearing God's voice and saying, yes, I'll go? And um, one way, I think, centering this on, on the, the, the uh, idea of the, the spirit of God here is to recognize that um, Isaiah is in this lofty space, this incredible space, and experiences the presence of God in just an awe-filling way. Um, And before we get to the specifics of what the text is, is saying, uh, and that this is Isaiah's call or the recognition of the place of King Isaiah to really linger on the fact that this text is about Isaiah experiencing the majesty of God. And he's actually 
eavesdropping on a chorus of angelic beings um, who actually would be more scary than, you know, fluffy little angels that we often, often think about as they are simply saying, holy, holy. I, I don't know what holy means in the 21st century. And don't try to explain it, but allow that awesomeness of this feeling of this grand place that causes Isaiah to say, whoa. I, I wonder if that might be a way to hold on to this Trinity uh, this Holy Trinity Sunday, uh, rather than making this my call statement. And I just refrain from doing that. So it can be done. <laughs> yeah, I think in the past, we've talked about the seraphim as basically um, flying snakes that are on fire, which that's kind of, that's my own trinity of no thank you <laughs> right there. Snakes with wings on fire. Um but yeah. The anyway, so yeah, the terror. So much more that the terror was lost. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, but I totally agree with you, Joy. For me, for me, the approach to Trinity Sunday is through the Old Testament. It's through this text and through the Psalm before it's uh, in, in the New Testament text. And I think that's for me. I don't know why this is. Maybe it's because I teach New Testament. Maybe because I work at a seminary. Who knows? But I, I worry when when we have this conceit that we somehow can explain the Trinity and describe the inner workings of the Trinity and imagine that like it's all disclosed to us in some ways. Um, I would rather start with the majesty of God, the unknowability of God. And the Psalm does that for me, but especially, you know, all what fills the temple isn't God. What fills the temple is the hem of God's robe. It's like <laughs> a little corner fills the temple and creates all of this um, majesty, right? And it's so think, you know, think of it with Moses only being able to see the back of God. This is even small, like, you know, this is Isaiah has glimpsed a, a, a hundredth of a hundredth of a hundredth of one percent, you know, of, of the divine majesty or something like that. And this is the response. And so I want that to open up humility, awe, wonder, and just an embrace of majesty before we before we do anything else on, on this on this particular Sunday. That's just me, but mm -hmm. um, I love also it. just reading the text. Yeah. No, I, I think holding Isaiah and Psalm 29 together from that perspective is is really important that that and especially kind of it, it I think it. Oh, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble for this, but it puts the Trinity in perspective <laughs> in that, you know, wrong with that? <laughs> that we're that. At the end of the day, that's what that's what the Trinity is trying to describe uh, and capture, as what both of you have said. This the holiness, the you know, just the glimpse of the hem of the robe of God, and so uh, it you know it 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 might even and that that at the end of the day, the glory and the holiness and the majesty of God can't be. Uh, can't be captured in anything that we could say, of course, but it might even, I don't know, it might even, I, I'm just thinking about this now, maybe a sermon that, that invites one's own sort of Trinitarian imagination, uh, the listener's Trinitarian imagination where, uh, if, is there a, is there a way that, where, where have you captured or where have you sensed of God or the mm -hmm. holiness of God. Uh, what would what would be your voice in that? Uh, that that doesn't have to uh, ascribe to a particular doctrine, but mm -hmm. does give witness to, as does the Trinitarian, as Trinitarian theology does to the majesty of God. And leave room for the questions. In, in mm -hmm. fact, highlight more. You know, have folks leave scratching their head more than, I mean, yes, nodding to the reality, but nodding in a, yep, I don't have a clue what 
is going on here? I like in the psalm that it's the voice of God that does these things. You know, it's just, it's not even necessarily the presence, right? But it's just, mm -hmm. again, a manifestation or emanation of God, of God's own speech is able to, to do all of this. Again, it's this reminder of the, the exposure, the revelation, the encounter that we have with God is by no means complete. Mm -hmm. Which of course makes it astounding when Jesus talks about things, and this isn't in our text, but um, about sharing in the same, you know, the end of John 16, about sharing in the same love that Jesus shares with the Father is now something we enter into. But like, like I said, that's, I think that all comes after we first have talked about <laughs> the sheer majesty of this God. That said, Romans as well. well we that, that, there, lead, that actually leads to us, that. Because that yeah, invites us yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, it's adoption, right? So to be adopted mm -hmm. into God's own family, to share all that that means in terms of a new identity, in terms of acceptance, in terms of, in the Roman world, things like uh, status and legal power and um, inheritance. I mean, in the Roman world, adoption is deeply tied into legacy and, and economics as much as mm -hmm. as much as other things. But um, so not to ignore those is important, but also not to define it just in terms of that. And and to hear the the, 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 the that's why I said you were tying into it to the. Um, how incredulous it is that we recognize the awesome presence of God, all that God is that is beyond our gray matter. And then God says, you belong to me. Wow. That becomes equally awe-inspiring. Yeah. And it's... Um... And again, the language there of not receiving a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of adoption and to think about, um, like you said, in the midst of that awe-inspiring holiness, uh, the response is belonging and that that's, it's different. So what are the emotions of Trinity Sunday would be a really interesting sermon as well. We don't yeah. talk about that, right? It's usually, what are the ideas and what are the the definitions around Trinity Sunday and why do we used to kill heretics for thinking this instead of thinking that, but uh, the emotions of this, how does it draw you in and where it's situated in the church year suggests part of that comes from the larger sweep of what happens from Advent through Pentecost. Yes. And what have you learned from God in the midst of all of that, of that, of that's re-narrativizing of, of um, traditions about Jesus. Matt, I think and that is the, that is an incredible homiletic way to go at it, um, out of the out of the head, and in this time into, you know, what are you feeling? What it, what what? Wow, I I really, I really am challenged by that. In the sense you you spoke a moment ago of of those categories of of the Roman culture and context, um, for folks to say I belong to Christ is a denial or was a denial of the categories of Rome. And, and so they obviously had seen the promises not yet filled by Rome as being filled by being a part of this community of Christ followers. Um, what does it take in your uh, very being to say, I want to belong to this because it's greater than what I've been promised in social, political, societal, dominant power over that 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 raises for me a fear of subservience rather than an awe of belonging. And I think too, going along with that, to uh, in in terms of the emotions of what what does it feel like actually to believe and trust in the claim you are children of God and and to be a child of God we use that phrase frequently uh, and but here it's to be brought up brought into that awesomeness and majesty of God in ways that we can't even begin to can't even begin to imagine <laughs>